So this is one of two videos that I'm actually going to cover here on the channel surrounding this topic. The first being the one you're seeing now, where Rainier accepts Kristen Cole's offer to marry him. And the second video will be the reverse of this one, where Kristen Cole accepts Rhaenyra's offer to be her paramour. So keep an eye out for that here on the channel. But before that, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and let's get into the video. In House of the Dragon, Rhaenyra Targaryen and her sworn knight Kristen Cole have a rather complicated relationship. Rhaenyra is the princess to a magical dragon-riding incestuous family and heir to the Iron Throne. Kristen Cole is a lowborn knight, a man of no real renown and also speculated to be Dornish. Dorne is the seventh kingdom in Westeros, but despite being claimed as such, they've never actually been subjugated by the Targaryens or submitted to their rule. Regardless, whether he's Dornish or not in the show hasn't really been expanded on, and I guess it doesn't really matter for this. In the early stages of their relationship between Kristen Cole and the princess, it had the makings of a typical fairy tale romance. A noble who never has to want for anything, and a commoner who has to work for everything. Two people from very different lives and backgrounds coming together for one reason or another, and discovering they have more in common than they think due to their trials and tribulations. This starts to be the case with Rhaenyra and Kristen Cole. Both come from very different walks of life, and yet despite the circumstances, their stories are fairly similar. Kristen Cole struggles to fit in because he's commonborn. Rhaenyra struggles because she's a woman obtaining power like no other. Both are positions that should have been unthinkable for people like them to obtain. Kristen is a lowborn man in the Kingsguard, where most of the men are nobles and renowned knights. Rhaenyra is the heir in line to inherit the throne forged by Aegon the Conqueror himself, a symbol of power only men have ever sat upon. These differences in trials seem to be something that they bond over in the story, at least earlier on. One day, not so long ago, you held enough power to write my name into the White Book. When your father named me to his king's guard, it was the highest honor any Cole had ever known. All that I have, I owe to you. But for better or worse, this bond ends up breaking apart. After an escapade with Damon leaves Rhaenyra wanting, she seeks out her sworn protector to do what Damon wouldn't. This single compromising act, you could argue, is what dooms the relationship, because after this incident, it's all downhill from there. Rainier loses her virginity to a man that is not her husband, and when Allison finds out, it compels her into conflict with Rhaenyra. Kristen Cole taints his honor with the blood of the princess's maidenhead, and as a result of soiling the highest honor his family has ever known by breaking his vows, he tries to remedy this poor decision by asking the princess to marry him. In his eyes, it's a perfectly reasonable proposition. They're both people whom the system of Westeros doesn't truly respect, people who have to always fight for what it is that they want. Even though Rhaenyra was named heir, she is a woman and will always have to prove herself worthy in the face of biased tradition. And Kristen Cole is a commoner. Despite being named to the King's Guard, it wasn't because of who he was, where his family came from, or how ancient their bloodline is. He's a soldier who has to prove himself time and time again, be it real conflict or in tournaments. But despite having common ground in their individual struggles, these two are far from being a fairy tale pair. Kirsten Cole believes it's his duty to restore his honor and that of the princesses by marrying her. I, I've, I've solved my, my, my white cloak. It is the only thing I have to my fucking name. I, I thought if we were married, I might be able to restore it. Whereas Rhaenyra's duty is to the crown. Unlike most stories where the princess would probably run away with her unlikely suitor, she turns him down, declining to give up her inheritance, that she seemed to lament from time to time, for a humble life in the countryside of another continent. She turns him down, which states that the fun doesn't have to end. Even if they can't be married, they can still share a bed. People do it all the time. It's a reckless and dangerous idea that drives a wedge between the princess and the knight that is unlikely to ever be removed. So the sword, once sworn to protect her, turns against her. But what if this didn't happen? What if Kristen Cole found his chance of redemption and love before he ever aligned with Alicent? What if Rhaenyra wanted more out of life than some old iron chair in the scornful glances of her subjects? What if Rhaenyra ran away with Kristen Cole? We'll set the stage in episode 5 after the royal family enters the marriage pact with House Valarian. Like in canon, after this meeting, Kristen Cole pulls the princess to the side. He tells her he's been thinking about the night they spent together, and Rhaenyra says she has as well. 
As the two talk, Kristen Cole begins to bring up his proposal. He remarks that Lenor is a decent and kind man, but that Rhaenyra did not choose him. He was chosen for her, and asks her that if there was another path that existed, one that led to freedom, would she take it? He remarks about the ships of oranges and cinnamon that he saw in Sunspear, and how he always wonders where they go. He makes a proposition to Rhaenyra. He wants to marry her, to go and see the world with her, without the burdens of her inheritance and his low political standing and position in the Kingsguard. I'm asking you to come with me, away from all of this. From the burdens and indignities of your inheritance, let us leave it all behind and see the world together. He says they could marry for love, and while I do believe they care for one another, I do not see this relationship as one of love. But regardless of if they do love each other or not, Rhaenyra does consider this, unlike in canon. Her whole life, there have always been restrictions about what she can and cannot do. As a woman in Westeros, she'll always be looked down on no matter what. Her meeting with Daemon in episode 4 really put this in perspective for her when they went and saw that play. Realms delight, a girl so young and so slight, loved by all of her people, but would she make a powerful queen, or would she be feeble? FEEBLE! So many people want her brother to rule. So many people think she'll be a terrible queen just based on her gender. She can't even have harmless fun and sleep with other people that she wants to like other men do without her inheritance being on the line. Despite being the princess, she's also just a pawn, being moved around to remedy the political problems of others, like her father. The son of the sea snake. So I can be a remedy for your political headaches. You are my political headache. So Rhaenyra really thinks about this. Is being queen worth it? Instead of just believing things will automatically go her way because Viserys said so, like in canon, she actually weighs things up in her mind. Sooner or later, she will inherit the Iron Throne. And if her current situation was anything to go off of, she would be a ruler, but always be in service. And as a woman, her reign will always be heavily scrutinized. Did she really want to live such an exhausting life like that? In this timeline, she's kind of thinking like Lainor was in the main timeline, willing to forsake his familial responsibility for the possibility of being happy in a place where no one knows his name, where he isn't Prince Consort or future Lord of the Tides and a Dragon Rider. He can just be a man and do as he pleases. And this is what Rhaenyra wants. Instead of letting the crown, the throne, the Targaryen legacy loom over her to dictate her life, she decides to dictate it herself. So ultimately, the princess decides to take up the knight's offer and run away. So later on, after returning home, Kristen Cole and the princess leave the castle, sneaking out the hidden passageway she used to go and see Daemon. But before she leaves, she takes a few items to buy them safe passage to Essos, and help give them a start once they get there. She also leaves a letter for her father, not detailing where she's gone, but telling him that he doesn't have to worry anymore, and that he can rest easy. His political headache has remedied itself. She also also leaves behind the Valyrian steel necklace she got from Daemon, symbolizing her abandonment of her heritage and duties to it. Kinda like how Lenor cuts off his locks in the main timeline. On the one hand, it is for discretion so no one really knows who or what he is, but I believe it also symbolizes him casting off the Valyrian name and lineage, since they are black and having dread seems to be a trademark for the men in this family, but I digress. Eventually, the letter is found. The castle goes on high alert as the king searches for his firstborn child. They go to the dragon pit to see if Cyrax is missing, and she isn't. Rhaenyra, like Laenor did in canon, left her dragon behind. She didn't want to run the risk of the dragon keeper seeing her and reporting things to her father. Nor did she want to run the risk of being caught once they made it to Essos. A giant yellow dragon would be a pretty easy thing to spot. Not to mention, they may not even be able to afford taking care of her to begin with. So with the princess's dragon being left behind, and no clear indicators as to where she went, it becomes clear that the heir is gone. This obviously means her engagement and agreement to Lenor is now null and void. But regardless, this doesn't stop Viserys from trying to solve his daughter's disappearance. She wouldn't be the first Targaryen to run away from home just because she was mad at her father. Old King Jaehaerys, while famous for his prosperous reign, 
was also infamous for his relationship with his daughters. Sarah Targaryen, one of old King Jaehaerys' daughters, was very promiscuous to say the least. At one point, she had three lovers and claimed to have slept with all of them, and when her father confronted her about it, she said she wanted to marry all three of them, comparing herself to Aegon the Conqueror and Maegor the Cruel. This, of course, didn't happen, and pissed off her father. In fact, he went to punish these men for defiling his daughter. One of them was named Braxton Beesbury, who's from the same house as Lyman Beesbury, the councilman. He demanded a trial by combat. He expected to fight one of the Kingsguard, but instead, King Jaehaerys himself chose to fight him, and killed him while his daughter watched. After this, she was sent to Old Town and given over to the Faith, but later on, she actually escaped and went to Lys in Essos, and took up work in a pleasure garden. Then she started her own pleasure garden in Volantis after earning money from working in a pleasure garden. So a Targaryen running away to Essos isn't exactly a new thing. Regardless though, Rhaenyra is lost to Viserys, and I could see this breaking the king in a way. He loved his daughter. Despite how they butted heads, he truly did care for her. She was the only thing left to him from his late wife Emma after he killed her, and now they were both gone. But in a way, it's worse than when Emma died. He doesn't have a body to burn, ashes to scatter. Rhaenyra is out there and anything could be happening to her. He blames himself for driving her away, but that doesn't mean the king is going to give up on her. I believe that while becoming mad with grief, unlike Jaehaerys who found out where his daughter was and never tried to reconcile or bring her back home, Viserys wouldn't rest until that's exactly what he did. He'd obsess over it, trying to find out where his daughter was and bring her back to him. I could see him spreading some of this blame he has for himself as well onto his brother Damon for her leaving because he's the one that took her out that night and claimed that he slept with her and because of that he had a falling out with his daughter. Had he not done that then maybe she would still be here. But in that same vein of thought I could also see him trying to enlist his brother's help in finding Rhaenyra. He may know her better and he's been to Essos before. If she's out there then perhaps he could find her. Then of course I would see him being upset with Kristen Cole, blaming him for his daughter leaving. Since the Princess Protector were gone, he started believing that he stole her away, seduced her even. He get hung up on all the factors of Rhaenyra's disappearance. Viserys would even start wearing her Valyrian necklace as well, the same way he wears Emma's ring after she died. With him being so obsessed with his daughter, this would most likely result in him having a more distant and strained relationship with his other children. And with the dark place the king is going to be in after losing his oldest child, it does beg the question, would he even have more children? We already know Aegon and Helena have been born at this point, maybe Aemon has been conceived, but assuming he isn't, depending on Viserys' mindset, he may stop having kids altogether. At least that's what I'm thinking in my mind. But regardless, there are other issues with Rhaenyra leaving. For starters, her disappearance leaves the succession in question. Since she's gone and there's no guarantee that she will return, this would by all means make Aegon the rightful heir to the Iron Throne. Rhaenyra hasn't had any kids of her own, and since we're going by age and not gender, this means that by all means, Aegon is next in line. But as I mentioned before, Viserys is obsessed with his daughter in the same way he is with his dragon dreams. He believes that Rhaenyra will come back, and maybe even that he will find her. So I don't imagine he'll officially acknowledge Aegon as the heir anytime soon. Another problem that would come from the princess's disappearance is the Valarians as well. They were expecting a marriage pact with the royal family, and now that it's null and void, this would definitely make Corlys very angry. It seems like every time he gets close to the Targaryen family, something gets in his way. First it was Otto, now Rhaenyra has left in a puff of smoke for all they know. But in better news for Laenor, this means he doesn't have to marry Rhaenyra and put up a facade. And since Kristen Cole is gone, this means that Joffrey Lonmouth never gets his face smashed in. But I doubt they'll celebrate too soon. In the immediate aftermath, I assume this betrothal to Rhaenyra would just be considered as on pause for the time being, but after days and months of nothing, then it's safe to assume that there will be no marriage. To remedy this, I could see Lionel proposing to Viserys that Aegon, even though he's so young, should marry Lena. 
she'd still be unwed at this point, and with Aegon being the heir, even if Viserys is slow to name him as such, this would be the Valarian's gateway to the Iron Throne. So I imagine Viserys would eventually accept this, and so would Corlys, as a sign of good faith and alliance between the families. But from here on out, things start going on a steady decline with Viserys. The endless searching for his daughter, neglecting his wife, his other children, and the realm more than he did in canon. Perhaps he even gets sicker as time goes on due to the grief, and his health starts declining even faster than it did in the original timeline. And since the king's condition is worsening, things would start being run mainly by Alicent and Lord Lionel Strong, since Otto would not have come back. When it comes to Alicent, with Rhaenyra and Kristen leaving, she doesn't find out about their affair until after they're gone. She has no reason to don her infamous green dress since Rhaenyra has left and basically forfeited her right to the Iron Throne, and she most likely will be more concerned about Viserys' health than being angry with her friend. She may still have some animosity towards Rhaenyra though, because not only did she forsake her duties, she ran away, abandoned her family, her father, the only parent that she has left and left him to suffer and waste away without her with no real closure. But since she's gone, she doesn't have to worry about the possibility of her killing her children. She won't be around producing bastards and claiming them as legitimate. So she won't complain to Laris about the bias the king has towards her and wish for her own father to be back, because Aegon is guaranteed to have the throne regardless. This means Lionel also never gets killed, nor does Harwin since he's not caught up with the princess. Aegon may even start to be a better person in this timeline since he won't have his mother's fears and grandfather's agenda forced on him from such a young age. But he may still have issues in some areas since Viserys is going to be more negligent of him in this timeline. He'll be so obsessed with someone who isn't there, and if he holds off on naming Aegon the heir for the hope of Rhaenyra returning one day, who knows what this could do to his son. Maybe he'll try even harder to be seen by his father, or give up altogether like he did in the canon timeline. Then I'm also sure that there will be some fear of Rhaenyra returning one day by some people at court. With Aegon in line to inherit the throne and possibly marry Talena, some people like Corlys, Alicent, maybe even Aegon himself who just wants to be seen by his dad, may feel afraid that she'd just show up one day and throw everything out of whack. But assuming she doesn't, one day Aegon will become king. Lena will be his queen, if that marriage happens, and for the time being, there will be no Dance of the Dragons. Unless, if sometime in the future, Rhaenyra and Kristen Cole's descendants try to come back and claim the inheritance she threw away. Which wouldn't be the first time something like that happened. Sarah Targaryen, the daughter of Old King Jaehaerys that I mentioned earlier in the video, actually had three sons, who all had different dads, but that's irrelevant, which came to the Great Council of 101 to put their claims forward to the Iron Throne. Obviously, though, that didn't work out for them. But the point still stands. Rhaenyra's descendants could come back one day and try to lay claim to the Iron Throne. But regardless of if they do or not, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, tell me what you thought in the comments, and I will see you all next time.